Greetings and welcome to Hangouts with Hive. Today's topic is what do the 2018 CDC estimates mean for women? My name is Yamini Oseguera Bhatnagar. I'm the Power Health Coordinator at Hive, a hub for positive reproductive and sexual health. It's the 29th of June in 2018, and I'm broadcasting live from San Francisco. Just a little bit about Hive. Since 1989, Hive, which was formerly the Bay Area Perinatal AIDS Center, has provided preconception and prenatal care to women and couples affected by HIV. Since 2005, all babies born in San Francisco have been free of HIV. Our mission is advancing reproductive and sexual wellness for individuals, families, and communities affected by HIV in San Francisco and beyond. Our vision is a world where people affected by HIV have safe pregnancies, reproductive autonomy, access to state-of-the-art healthcare, and enjoyable sex lives. A little bit about Hangouts with Hive. Hangouts began in November 2015 as a way to really learn and share the good work of innovative advocates and providers around the country who have a commitment to HIV prevention. Since 2015, Hangouts has featured the vision and the work of over 50 champions from all over the US. In 2018, we turn our heads to take a closer look at the reasons for HIV acquisition among women. We'll be thinking and talking about the ways that women engage in care and don't, uh, manage competing priorities in their lives, navigate, navigate systems like the criminal justice system, social services, child welfare, and are impacted by racial inequities. We hope to learn together with our panelists and viewers to shift our practice to better reach and serve women. A little bit more on today's topic. Today, we're here to learn more about the CDC's uh, 2018 estimates of the number of cis women for whom PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis is indicated. A couple of key pieces of 2018 data to think about as we learn more. Nationally, an estimated 1.1 million people have indications for PrEP. Of these, 176,670 are cis women. Among cis women with indications for PrEP, 64% are black women, 18% are Latinas, and 14% are white. As we're listening and learning from our panelists today, let's think about our own work and how this data affects um, our work locally. Just a couple of tips for viewers as we delve into the content of the hour. We're going to broadcast for the next one hour. Um, during this time, as you listen to our panelists and our discussion, please ask questions in one of two ways. You can type your questions in the um, comment section of the YouTube page you're watching from, or you can text your questions to 415-842-2722. That's 415-842-2722. Um, if you like what you're hearing, show us some love on Twitter. We're going to be on Twitter using the hashtags prep for women, the prep, the number four women, as well as hashtag where's my prep. Um, if you missed the live broadcast and are watching the recorded video, please look in the comments section of the YouTube page for a link to lead you to a list of resources that relate to this hangout. Today's discussion is gonna be a little bit different than our past hangouts. Um, it's gonna be a moderated question and answer session um, between our panelists. And then we'll have time for Q&A from the audience. So without further ado, here are our superstar panelists of the day. Dr. Don Smith. Um, is the Biomedical Interventions Activity Lead in the Epidemiology Branch of the Division of HIV AIDS Prevention at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. She conducts research and activities supporting the implementation of daily oral antiretroviral pre-exposure prophylaxis and other biomedical interventions to reduce rates of new HIV infections in the United States, including the development of U.S. Public Health Service clinical practice guidelines for PrEP. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for being with us. 
Hello, thank you for inviting me. Um, I was asked to talk about... Um, um, Dr. Smith, I'm just gonna um, also introduce Nika and Leisha and then I'll come back to you. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Nika Seidman, or Nika Seidman rather, um, is an assistant professor in obst obstetrics, gynecology, and reproductive sciences at UCSF and a clinician at San Francisco General Hospital. Her research interests include the intersection of HIV STI care and the prevention and HIV prevention and family. Thanks, Nika, for joining. Thanks for having me. And Leisha McKinley Beach is a national HIV AIDS consultant currently working with the US Women in PrEP Working Group and Sister Love to ensure women are included in PrEP research, media, and clinical implementation. Leisha recently launched a website, leisha.org, that's L E I S H A.org, to highlight community conversations in the South about PrEP and HIV prevention. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Nika to help us moderate a little um, Q&A session with our awesome panelists, Nika. Thanks, Yamini, and thanks for organizing all of us. Um, I wanted to dive right in um, and go to Dr. Smith. Don, thank you so much um, for participating today and for doing a really incredible presentation at CROI, um, which is a big HIV conference for those of you who don't know, um, about these data. Um, it was very clear um, and really important work. And we're hoping today that you'll give this, provide this some background on the, simil the same data um, for a lay audience so, so that for those of us who are not epidemiologists and researchers can understand your important work. Thanks. Okay. So um, I was asked to come and talk about how we arrived at the numbers that we arrived at in 2018 and particularly because they're a little bit different than numbers we had put forward um, in, in uh, 2016. Um, so, can you put up the first slide? Uh, I see it. Is there any way for it to come like on the screen right now? I'm seeing Nika's face and I only see the slide as it's really teeny tiny little image. Is it still not? Ah, now there it is. Okay. So in 2016, um, we, we made the first estimates of the number of people with indications for PrEP. And then um, in 2017, um, we um, presented uh, an updated set of indications that included um, consideration of transmission risk group and race ethnicity, which we were not able to do the first time around. Next slide. So in the first estimate, which was published in a document called Vital Signs, um, what we did was we looked at um, surveys that were done in such a way that they were representative of all people in the United States. Um, and we used them to look at risk behaviors that people had reported um, among those who were adults to see how many had an indication for PrEP. But these data, even though they're very good for making a national estimate, have very small numbers of people within a given state or within a given city. And so we couldn't, we couldn't break it down beyond the national level. Um, so when we did the analysis where we said to look at all women in the United States um, and tell us how many of them have the criteria that we consider indications for PrEP, we found that 0.6% or six out of a thousand women in, in the whole United States um, would have a risk for PrEP. And then we multiplied that by the, the, the number of women in the United States to get a number um, who had PrEP indications in the whole US. But 
um, even though that gave us a good number at the national level, we knew that um, that there were big variations in um, the likelihood of exposure to HIV. So if I have multiple partners or I have an STI um, in a place where there's very little infection, my risk of getting infected is lower. And if I do the, have those exact same behaviors, but in a pop in a community where there's a lot of HIV infection, then I'm more likely to encounter HIV and get infected. And we weren't able to account for that. So next slide. So this is how we did the initial uh, estimate for heterosexual adults. We took a large study um, called the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, where they take vans out into the communities all across the United States. They interview people, they take blood specimens. One of the things they do is they test for HIV. And we, we said, give us the data for everybody age 18 to 59. Um, and that uh, for heterosexual men that were not, that did not report having sex with men. And then of those, give us all the ones who tested HIV negative. And so once we had those, then we looked at the survey data from another large survey, which is called the National Survey of Family Growth. And we asked to look at men and women who were age 15 to 44, who reported having sex with an opposite sex partner in the last 12 months, and who, or who had sex with more than two, two or more partners in the last six months, and then among those, we said, okay, tell us how many had either an HIV positive partner or had um, sex without a condom. Um, the way that they asked the question was in the last four weeks or sex with a person who injects drugs or um, for women only, um, those who had sex without a condom um, in the last four weeks or who reported that they had sex with a man who also has sex with men during the last 12 months. Those were the items that were in the survey that we could use um, for this analysis. So then we applied that to the total number of women that we um, had estimated from the, from the first analysis, and that allowed us to weight it up to a national level and get and national number of women with indications for PrEP. Next slide. What we did in the new analysis, because we really wanted to be able to account for differences in, in likelihood of exposure to HIV, um, we started in a different place. And that is we had an analysis that told us how many MSM there are in every state in the United States who reported sex with a man in the last five years and who were over 18. We adjusted that to reflect the number of MSM who had reported sex in the past year. And then we said, okay, if we look at new HIV diagnoses in a state as an indication of the amount of HIV that's circulating in the population, we can say that the, we know how many of the new diagnoses were in MSM, and we know how many MSM there were in the state overall, and we know how many of the new diagnoses were in heterosexuals. And the number that were in heterosexuals, the number of new diagnoses in heterosexuals compared to the number of new diagnoses in MSM should give us a measure, a relative measure of the likelihood of exposure to HIV. Um, and so we did the same thing for PWID in the state. Um, we, so next slide. So that's how we got the heterosexual estimate um, for each state. And then we added up the states to get a national level. Next slide. 
So then once we knew, how, I, we had an estimate of the number of MSM, the number of heterosexuals, and the number of persons who injected drugs, within each one of those groups, we used a similar process. We know the proportion of all diagnoses among MSM that were contributed, that were, that were black MSM. So we could use that ratio um, to determine the number of, um, of black MSM who had indications for PrEP. And the same thing <coughs> for white and Hispanic. And we did that same process for heterosexuals <coughs> and for persons who inject drugs. Next slide. So when you added those up across all the states, in the, tw in the original estimate, there were 492,000 MSM. And in the new method, there were 826,410 MSM. Among heterosexuals, there were originally 624,000, and that became 266,210. And for PWID, it went from 115,000 to 77,220. The total didn't change much. The total in the US went from 1.2 million to 1.2 million if you round, um, 1.169 up. And then we were, but then we were also able to look by race as well as by risk group. And what you see is that um, among MSM, for example, the total, the 800,000 or so total, 300,000 of those were black MSM. Among heterosexuals, among the 266,000, 170,000 were black heterosexuals. Um, and for PWID, um, black and white PWID were roughly equal um, in terms of their contribution. If you look as at the total, however, among the 1.2 million um, who had uh, indications for PrEP, uh, half of those almost, 511,000, 512,000 were black. Next slide. So thinking specifically about heterosexual adults with PrEP indications, in the vital signs estimate, women were 468,000 roughly, and in the new method, they're 177,000. And we were able to then look by state and divide um, the number uh, into, into five equal groups, you know, the high, from the highest group to the lowest group. And what you can see is that in the darker states um, have uh, higher proportions of their um, heterosexual populations, uh, of, the, of the populations with PrEP indications were heterosexuals. So it's a reflection of what the heterosexual risk looks like. And you can see Washington, New York, Florida, uh, Alabama, Louisiana, um, in New Jersey, um, these are the places that have the greatest proportion of those who have indications for PrEP who are heterosexual adults. Next slide. Dr. Smith, that was your last slide. Oh, okay. So um, those are the numbers and I'm um, happy to take questions. That was terrific. Thank you so much. Um, Don, I wonder if before going to Alicia, I could ask you two brief follow-up questions. Um, the first one was, um, if you were able to look at racial disparities um, within women specifically in terms of number of black women, for example, um, who we think are eligible for PrEP based on these new, um, these new numbers and the proportions, um, and if not, why it's hard to estimate those numbers. We could not estimate those numbers at the state level because you get smaller and smaller numbers. But I think we know nationally that um, about two thirds of the women with indications for PrEP are African-American. Great, thank you. 
um, those disparities are really, really striking. Um, and thank you for, for demonstrating that beautifully with those numbers, or strikingly, I guess, is a better way to put it. And my other question was in terms of people who inject drugs, just for our, the people who are watching, just as a reminder, T PWID or people who inject drugs, if we know the gender breakdown for that group as well. Again, we have, a, we have a numbers problem when we get down, because we started at the state level and summed up, we weren't able to do that. Great, thank you. Um, I wanted to turn to Lisha for a few minutes. Um, and Lisha, it's an absolute pleasure to have both you and Don on the same, in the same conversation um, because you're both um, working on this issue, issue from very different angles. Um, so Lisha, I wonder if you could just start by telling us a little bit about your work and how these types of numbers inform what you work on. Absolutely. First, I want to thank Hive um, so much uh, for this invitation um, and to be on the same panel with um, Dr. Smith. I mean, again, that's something I can check off my bucket list. So um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I will never forget today. Stop, Lisa. Um, <laughs> um, so just a little bit about the work um, that I've been doing. I've been very fortunate uh, to work with the U.S. Women in Prep Working Group um, along with the convener, uh, which is uh, Sister Love uh, here in Atlanta. And the conversation uh, with the working group has been to ensure that women are included in prep research, media, uh, implementation, um, because one of the things that um, we do sometimes in HIV um, is we repeat history. And for those of us who were around when um, HIV first came on the scene, there was a perception um, that HIV did not impact black communities. And almost 40 years later, we are still trying to dispel that myth in many communities. And so when PrEP first came on the scene, many of the images around promoting PrEP did not look like some of the populations that we're talking about today that Dr. Smith just um, discussed in, in her research. Um, and it's very unfortunate because here we go again trying to play catch up in many instances of raising uh, awareness um, about, um, about this tool. Um, I, I really think that uh, part of what I heard today confirms the work um, that we've been doing and that we need to continue to do. Number one is raise awareness about PrEP and other prevention strategies, um, specifically within Black communities. Um, so many people don't even know that this exists. Um, and, and that's a problem. Um, and then in addition to community, raising the awareness and training for the clinical community, um, because uh, oftentimes women are not prioritized when it comes to PrEP. And even in um, one of our great national uh, partners, uh, Planned Parenthood, um, they talk about this in their uh, pilot uh, PrEP program um, from last year about how some of the affiliates, they did increase the number of prescriptions um, for PrEP, but they were among men. And so some of it was even changing the culture within a clinical setting known for women um, around prioritizing that group. Um, and then looking at risk. And I think that we have done a disservice in, in, in many instances of using high risk. Um, when I looked at some of the uh, qualifiers from the research study, there were things like condomless sex in the past four weeks. And, and for some, they don't consider that risk. And so it's even changing our terminology when we talk about prevention and who might can benefit um, from that. Um, and that using the term high risk 
makes a distinction between women who may not consider themselves um, at a uh, high risk. Um, and so one of the things that, um, that has come out of all of these discussions um, is looking at um, a place like Florida, where I'm actually headed to. Um, Florida um, launched the campaign 10 years ago. Um, it was called um, Sisters Organizing to Survive. And during that time, that campaign focused on getting black women tested, that black women were going to commit to know their HIV status and then encourage other women um, to know their status as well. And so um, the, um, the Florida Department of Health released data that caused the resurgence uh, with this committee and not just because um, this is their 10 year anniversary. June 20th was the 10 year anniversary. But to hear data that two black women in the state of Florida get diagnosed with HIV every single day is unacceptable. And so these women um, have also motivated me to, well, let's find out why this is occurring with all of the resources that we have and with all of the prevention programs that we have, we're talking about two black women being diagnosed every day. And so I thought about what is it that I can do um, outside of the opportunities that I've had with uh, Sister Love and the Black AIDS Institute and also promoting the content um, from Hive um, that you'll see on the website um, as well, is we don't spend enough time just hearing from everyday folks, not from people who are in the workforce, not from organizations, but people that you would meet at the grocery store, at the family reunion, at the old school hip hop concert, those people. And so for the next 12 months, that's my contribution is to go out in places across the South um, and not just in our metro areas. You may see me show up in Greenville, Mississippi or Two Egg, Florida, <laughs> um, just talking to women about what they know about HIV and prevention, um, what they know about local resources. Have they ever heard of PrEP? And if they have, you know, do they know where they can get it? I've been very fortunate this year. I've had the opportunity to interview um, 24 PrEP users. And of the 24, 23 of them did not say that they heard about PrEP from a commercial, from a billboard, from a brochure. 23 of the 24 said they heard about it from word of mouth, from a partner, from a friend, from someone who might have been in the clinic and they found out about it and they shared that with them. One person, um, I have to give a shout out to Shonda Rhimes um, for how to get away with murder <laughs> because one person said that's where they heard about it from. And they went online and they looked it up and they realized based on their risk that this would be something that they would be interested in. So it said to me for us in this great strategy of what we can do nationally, what we can do locally, is not to dismiss the significance of having a conversation. And so that's, that's my um, contribution. Um, in addition to that, um, the U.S. Women in Prep Working Group, they have a statement that they released um, this year that highlighted some of their um, strategies in terms of um, you know, ensuring that women were represented in conversations around research um, for PrEP, um, also ensuring that when media is released that there are images that look like us. Um, one of the models that I think that has done an outstanding job with that um, has been actually there's two. One is a video released by Hive itself, um, which I think is a great conversation starter for women. 
But the Black AIDS Institute also released a Black Women in Prep Toolkit that has images from women from 18 to 60. Um, and when, when people see that, there's a connection. That looks like me. They must be talking to me. This strategy must be for me. Um, and I think it's so important that um, we don't belittle that, you know, because all of this great research and work that we've done, if it's not getting to the people who need it the most, then it's for naught. So I'll stop there. Nisha, thank you so Nisha, much for your so important your work and your powerful messages. Powerful messages. Um, I wanted to ask um, you to ask both um, a little bit about, you both spoke to what I thought was the most really important message from Dr. Smith's work, which, which was these really striking um, geographic, racial, and disparities by gender in terms of PrEP use. Um, what is your, how do you kind of put together the drivers of these disparities? I know, I know we could talk about this for hours, but kind of in a nutshell, um, for some listeners who um, might, be, might be new to this topic, what do you think are the drivers and, um, and how can those influence our steps forward? Alicia, why don't you start? Okay, sure. Um, you know, I think that um, there are things that we're putting into place now that may just require us to expand on them. Um, I don't know if people have seen yet the, um, the Gilead uh, commercial that came out about PrEP. I saw it the other night. And it's very exciting to see um, that message making its way to mainstream media. Um, and so having more content or things like that um, to raise awareness about PrEP, I also think it's going to be so, so critical for our clinical community and not just our clinicians that work in HIV, OBGYNs, general practitioners, to be able to have these conversations around PrEP and not um, um, determine um, risk for say, um, that if you are not a same gender loving man, then there's no need to have that conversation. I think that that's gonna be the game changer is seeing the expansion of our clinical uh, partners across the country. Um, but also, as I mentioned earlier, I don't want to take away from some of just the simple tools of talking to people. You know, I, I, I really understood the impact a couple of months ago. My sister uh, was in one of the sessions and the uh, trainer said, how many people have heard about PrEP? And then my sister raised her hand. She was one of the few people. And the trainer said, tell me what you know about PrEP. Now, her answer wasn't the way that I had described it to my family, but she said, um, it's a pill that you can take once a day. You're not supposed to miss taking it, um, and it'll prevent you from HIV, but you're still supposed to use some rubbers with it, too. That's what my sister said. Um, and so everyone around the room, they chuckled, but she was a reminder of me of the power of a conversation within my own family. Um, as well. And so when people start thinking about and saying, what can I do as an individual, maybe somebody who is not from the workforce, you take that knowledge and you share it with other people. Um, and the last thing that I'm going to say is, again, like using this Florida model right now of these women building these chapters across the state to say, we can do that. We can have a conversation. Florida is now, the Surgeon General has set a goal that all 67 health departments will be offering PrEP by the end of the year. That's huge. But if people don't know that they can access it in their local resource, it becomes a model where we built it, but they didn't come. And so community can help us um, in, in those endeavors. So Nika, I, there are a couple things I would add. First of all, um, there is just such a concentration of HIV infection in the black community um, that 
even even a small amount of risk behavior um, can lead to HIV infection. Um, and that's not necessarily true in other populations and other communities. Um, so I think people are not aware that um, that they need to take care of themselves in this way. Um, most members of the black community understand that hypertension is more common in our population and they know that they need to get their blood pressure checked. But they, they don't understand about about HIV, they think it's just MSM. And if I'm not an MSM, then I don't have to worry about it. Um, so I think that's one, one reason for the disparity, particularly for women. Um, the other thing that's unfortunate about that is that women actually get tested for HIV more than men do because many women get pregnant at some point in their life and they always get an HIV test during their pregnancies. So the, the opportunities to engage women around HIV when they're negative are pretty common. And yet that hasn't been the case. What we've done is we've said most HIV testing is to identify that you're positive so that we can protect your baby or so that we can get you on treatment for your own health. And if you're negative, well, good for you. And I'm moving on to the next patient. And I think PrEP gives us an opportunity to go that extra step with the women who test negative and say, okay, we'd like to keep you negative, so let's, let's have a conversation about some things that, that you need to know um, so that you can make a choice about how to stay negative, given that in your community there is a lot of HIV infection. Um, so I think we have, we have lots of opportunities to intercede. One of the things that's striking to me is that 10 years ago, when I first started talking about the fact that PrEP might be coming um, to people in different communities. I could go into many communities and find a women's working group that was focused on microbicide awareness. Um, there was a big network of women's groups that were pushing microbicides, even though they were not through trials yet, but they were doing awareness and education. Most of those have gone away. There are not a network now of women's HIV-related health organizations in many communities. We have national organizations in big cities. We have, we have, you know, in Atlanta, we have Sister Love. In San Francisco, you have Hive. But um, that kind of network of, of, um, of uh, women's communities talking to each other about these issues really has shrunk in the 10 years and things like SOS need to be expanded again so that we can get the message into the community in a different way. Donna, I'm so glad we just got you on tape saying what I thought I think is such a clear message to clinicians in particular about how um, HIV risk is so different for different people, and you can't really just have a message about about an individual changing an individual's behaviors because it's the environment in the community in which someone lives, um, and you just can't put that burden on an individual. And um, and that driver of disparities is really um, critical for P I think providers in particular to understand. Um, and Leisha, I wanted to turn back to you and ask you. How how can we how can we offer that messaging um, to women um, and the community in a way that is saying you know we recognize that um, this vulnerability exists at a community level. This is not your individual behaviors. Just by being a sexually active adult or person um, in a community, you are at a different risk from for someone else. And so we want to offer you this important HIV prevention method. Um, how can we how can we get that that message out there? Um, beyond kind of clinic rooms, because a lot of these people aren't even coming into clinics, or like Don said, they're coming in at isolated points in time, like around pregnancies. Well, I, I do want to first start with clinics because sometimes that's a missed opportunity in itself. And I just know from personal experience here in Atlanta, my husband and I have the same primary care provider 
and he offered him, actually, he didn't offer, he included HIV testing as a part of his routine um, uh, lab work. And then when I went back for my annual, he did not do that. And then when I asked for the test, he looked at my chart and he said, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were married. So he made a decision about my risk based on my marital status. Um, and that wasn't 1989, you know, that was last year. And so there are some missed opportunities even in the clinical setting. But I do wanna say that in terms of community, it still holds true. The message matters and the messenger matters. And sometimes it's taking information like I did with my sister and sharing it um, in, in, a, in a more clinical context. And she translated it in a way that she could understand it. And so all the girlfriends she have that play cards with her on the weekends, they are hearing about PrEP. They probably could never tell us that it's pre-exposure prophylaxis, but they do know that it's a pill out there that they can take one a day. And we got to be um, okay with framing our preventive message in that way that community can take the lead and educate its own um, in, in that manner. And so always having these different tools um, from Hives and the Black AIDS Institute and the U.S. Women in Prep Working Group and all of these entities just to be mindful of that. Pre-exposure prophylaxis may never be the terminology that's used, but if we get the concept right of appeal that they take one a day, it prevents HIV, and that we still encourage the use of condoms because of sexually transmitted infections, we have just built an army of educators that's helping us in places that folks may never come into the health department. They may never get invited to a local HIV planning group meeting, but the word has now gotten out. Thank you so much, Leisha. Um, I wanted to ask one more question before we go to the um, to anybody who might be listening who has questions. Um, I wanted to ask both of you if any of these, what about these data um, beyond what we've talked about, if anything was particularly surprising or if all of this was kind of consistent with what you expected? Um, or if, um, if not, um, what, from Don, what, what data can we look forward to learning from in future? And, and Leisha, what kind of data, what, what additional data, if any, do you think you need to kind of do your work? Dr. Smith, you want to start first this time? <laughs> Okay, um, what, we're, what we're in the process of doing is taking the, um, the calculations that we use to develop the state level um, estimates and putting them on to, into the web, onto the web at a site that anybody can use. Um, and it will have county level data as well. And that will let us um, update the, in the background, update the tables so that um, you know the health departments um, can look and say, oh, well, I see that they estimate this for my jurisdiction. I think that's wrong. I'm going to put in the number that we have from our local surveillance, and then it will do the rest of the calculations for you to tell you, um, you know, what what prep indications look like in your jurisdiction. Um, and we're hoping that this will help people to plan so that, you know, if I know, if I'm in a small, uh, in a place that has a lot less HIV infection and I see that there are a thousand people that I need to provide PrEP to eventually, and let's say I know now there are maybe 200 people, now I have some idea about how much capacity I need to build. And how and how and how much more outreach I need to do in order to get a good coverage level. So we're hoping that this will help, um, particularly health departments, um, to plan for um, additional resources for prep. And one of the things that I truly appreciate um, from the way that Dr. Smith described the data 
is it gives even local community groups, um, advisory groups, something that they can work towards, right? So we're not just pulling a number out of the sky. If you're in an area where a thousand women could benefit from PrEP, we're knowing that about 64% of them um, are black women, where can we introduce these prevention messages train people, have conversations where we can touch some of those women. And that's, that's to me, when we create data, there should be action to follow. And that data in the way that Dr. Smith framed it today gives us an opportunity to create some action um, to follow it. So that's very exciting. And uh, one thing I will add is that, you know, that two thirds number is across the country. There are places in the U.S. where the proportion of women who need PrEP is, uh, who are black is much higher than that. And there are other places where it's much lower than that. And so it would give individual places an opportunity to look at what their epidemic looks like and, and where they need to focus their resources. So it may be in your community that there are equal numbers of black and Hispanic women who have indications for PrEP. Now you have to think about, well, okay, where are the clinics that would serve the black women? Where are the clinics that would serve the Hispanic women? And in some places, it may be that most of the women are white, fine. Then you know that that's where you need to put a lot of your effort. Um, so I think it will be helpful for, for people to understand the dynamic at their local level. Sounds like an incredibly valuable tool, um, both in terms of PrEP implementation in general and in, in terms of really focusing on the disparities that are just, we really need to use a, an equity lens with all of this. Um, and so the more local data you have, just like you said, um, the more I think it is driven home to local health departments about how they specifically are, um, are really driving these disparities and how they can put and how we can put um, action into really distribution of resources to, to, to close those gaps, because we have a ton of work to do, like you showed us. Um, so I wanted to thank you both so, so much um, and ask Yamini um, to see if we have any additional questions. We do. Um, first thing I'm gonna do is um, ask a question to Nika, actually. Um, a question came in that asked specifically about um, are there resources that offer guidelines for screening, screening black women for PrEP that include the risks that Dr. Smith um, mentioned being um, sort of taking into account environment and community viral load, essentially? Sorry, Yamini, was that for me? I, you cut out for a moment. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So I, I think um, that's such a great question. Um, I think you can look at the CDC guidelines and um, really use those to tailor to your specific um, environment, like Dr. Smith said. Um, and in particular, um, for areas of where there where HIV is concentrated, um, and where um, we know that women are really not really don't know about PrEP. Um, one really useful way to spread this information is to give information about PrEP to absolutely everyone um, and then start talking about how HIV is prevalent in, in our community. If you're a sexually active adult, you shouldn't not only know about PrEP, but consider PrEP for yourself. Um, and these are specific um, risk factors that might put, make you vulnerable to HIV, but really everyone in this community is eligible for PrEP and we're offering PrEP to everyone. And kind of doing that more universal approach in particular of areas where, um, like Don talked about, um, that can be a real, really powerful message in that this is for everybody. This is not at all just targeting you. Um, in terms of specific resources, um, I think this concept a lot of um, people in the HIV prevention world are starting to talk about is just this fundamental concept of universal education for everyone. Um, and then doing screening after that, because we do know that in addition to um, 
the drivers of the disparities that our um, great panelists talked about today, we also know that there are barriers to disclosure of HIV vulnerability. And that comes from a long history of the way that healthcare providers um, work with patients. And we know that there, just as an example, there are strong histories of racism in medicine um, and reasons that people um, withhold information. And they don't, people aren't withholding information because they want to, but they don't think there's going, they're going to get anything useful from that information that they're sharing. So what we've beginning, begun to learn from women is that by sharing information first, um, it takes away one of those steps of, of women thinking that they're not gonna get anything from disclosing. And so after sharing information about PrEP, diving into um, a little bit of information about what might put someone, make someone vulnerable to HIV, and then asking women, women, do you think you might be interested in PrEP? You can, in many ways, just sidestep that whole screening question altogether, in particular in areas of the country um, that we've been talking about today. Um, for other places, I think the other piece that's really important is when people come in asking for PrEP, um, trusting women um, in their own self-assessments of HIV risk. Um, I think we're learning more and more and these data are new that most likely um, people really can assess their own HIV vulnerability and we know this is a really safe medicine. So big picture, kind of to answer your question, are there specific tools? I think we, we have um, the CDC guidelines as a big tool um, that kind of lists a whole different type of risk factors. And then with these new data that Don suggested and our more and more understanding of how much um, this um, HIV prevention really needs to have a local focus um, and tailored to, to your community, um, in particular for black women in the, the South, um, but I think really everywhere, spreading information that HIV prevention information is for everyone, and then um, offering PrEP and having using that as a conversation into what are screening and risk factors and is PrEP right for you as an individual. Um, Dawn or Alicia, did you want to shed some light on that question about how to incorporate um, the fact that many women live in communities and um, and have sex in communities where the community viral load is really high? I think Mika answered that well. Great. Um, another question I want to ask is um, that um, this is from someone uh, working as a coordinator um, for ending the epidemic campaign. Um, a lot of African-American folks shy away from medical systems because of a lot of what Nika just mentioned and has already been talked about, the history of racism in medicine and just um, the, the history of the inability for providers to connect with patients. And so how do we um, bridge that gap when folks come into clinics feeling already um, uh, not connecting with the system itself and the providers that they're seeing. Anyone have thoughts on that? First of all, the, the question is a little bit confusing because it starts off by saying they're not coming in and then it concludes by asking what to do when they do come in. But I guess what I would say is that most African Americans seek health care at some point for something. What they don't generally have is a primary care provider that they see on a regular basis for annual physicals or this, that, or the other thing. Um, and that's particularly true for men, but it's also true for women. So women may come in because they have, um, you know, a cold, um, or they may come in because they have uh, uh, they they are pregnant, um, or they may come in, you know, for for other kind of episodic reasons. Um, and providers typically don't start talking about chronic medication when you come in because you have a bad cold, you have a fever, and you're coughing, and you want to know if you have pneumonia. They're not generally going to start taking a sexual history and talking to you about HIV prevention. So I think um, it is true that that there are some historical barriers that keep people from accessing, specifically African-Americans, from accessing healthcare. I think the bigger issue for many, um, for African-Americans who are unemployed or who are poor, who are the working poor, is the cost of healthcare um, is 
the barrier for um, coming into care for getting services. And you know, you may you may want to put off any kind of healthcare visit for as long as possible, um, just for financial reasons. Um, and it's not clear that the HIV community itself can do anything about that. For PrEP in particular, there are a number of um, programs that will help to cover the cost of PrEP care um, for such persons. But the general problem that we have with affordable health care in the U.S. is really beyond the scope of what we can do in PrEP. And, and I also think that, you know, we, we talk a lot about medical mistrust, especially in black communities, because it's true and it's real. Um, but there's also a trust, a trust with um, local leaders, a trust with people who have been identified as a leader um, within the community. And many clinics, you know, may not even know this, but the best commercial um, for your services is not what you put on television, it's by word of mouth. And so if there are specific um, clinics within an area where folks have been and they felt like um, they you know, uh, catered to their needs, they felt that they were culturally relevant, they understood the language that they used when they walked in there and that it makes them feel stupid by saying certain terms, they're going to tell other people in the community that is the place to go. And those are the places that we want to, um, you know, ensure that they have the information about PrEP um, and in many instances also know how they can um, finance PrEP. Um, if you're, you know, in, 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 in other places, as Dr. Smith said, you know, they may not have health insurance. And, and that is the reality for many, especially in the South. And so, um, um, so just making sure that as we have this conversation around medical mistrust, that there are folks that people do trust and, and they're going to be key to helping us promote this message. Thank you. That's a really um, rounded response from all. Um, Dr. Smith, a direct question about um, when state level data will be available. Is there any? Um, all, I can, all I can say is soon. We have, you know, it takes a process to get it published online. I would say that the state level estimates are published and are available as a publication. Um, um, they were published in the Annals of Epidemiology. Great. So we're slowly running, not slowly, we're very rapidly running out of time, but I wanted to make space for our three um, very amazing panelists who took time out of their schedules to do this today to share any last feedback um, or comments which, with each other. So um, anyone want to start? Any last thoughts? Um, I just want to say again, thank you to Hive um, for uh, this opportunity. This has been a great conversation um, today. Um, and um, I am on the road starting tomorrow uh, with these video interviews. And so um, you know, let's hear what community people have to say um, about PrEP and, and what they know. Um, the videos will be posted at leisha.org. And um, we want you know, to be able to utilize some of those recommendations in frame the work that we do. Um, and again, I hope that somebody got you know, my picture like side by side with Dr. Smith. This was such an honor. I promise you, I will never forget it. So thank you. You're acting like you and I don't know each other. I know, but every time it just doesn't get old, Don. It doesn't oh, get old. Oh, stop. Um, <laughs> I w I really want to thank you for putting this together. It was a it was a a good opportunity to revisit these multiple perspectives on how to how to approach um, HIV infection prevention for women. And you know, here at CDC, we um, we don't always have as much input from the community as we would like to have. And this was another opportunity to hear that. So thank you. 
And I'll just add that I, um, I appreciate both of your work so much. Um, and as a, as a clinician who prescribes PrEP, um, both of your work informs what I do every day. Um, and without, without these pop partnerships and without this type of information, I feel like my hands are tied. And so, Leisha, I can't wait to see your videos. Um, I think for all of, uh, all of us, you know, I think creating an, an army of people um, who are out in the community and um, trying to make linkages with clinics, I think clinicians really want to hear from you. Um, and for people who haven't been into clinics, um, if they can come in with someone they've heard, from, heard about, had a good experience in the community, or if they get a referral from them, then um, your work is really um, transforming into to action and HIV prevention and changing those disparities. So thank you both so much. Amazing. Well, it's been an honor to host this. Um, one thing I will say is that I really appreciate um, you all stepping outside of your roles to have this very interdisciplinary conversation. Um, I think this is the future of what we will do um, around HIV prevention for women and just around healthcare in general. Um, so I really thank you for that. Um, to folks watching uh, and registered, you will receive an email with lots of resources relating to what you heard today. Um, and if you are not watching live, then you can check out a link in the comment section that will lead you to this very same page. Thank you all very much. This was Hangouts with Hive.